If you've ever watched Ban Thy Rescue, you're going to listen firsthand to one of the lifeguards, and his name is Dean Gladstone. Dean, you're very welcome. Patrick, it's a pleasure to be here with you always. And, and I'm uh, intrigued think... how a lifeguard comes across breathing, and that's what I'd love the conversation to be about, you know. Um, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's going to be an interesting talk in this area. So just if, if you were to give people just a little bit about your background, I know you said that you were, if you were filming today, et cetera, but even before that, how you came across breathing, what you, what you strive for so that people get a little insight into you. Yeah, well, Patrick, you know, I've got a, a story that's a little bit similar to your own. You know, I was hospitalized with asthma when I was nine. Um, from there, I, I, I start, actually, I was swimming before that and I'd stopped swimming and hospitalized with asthma multiple times and went back swimming. And that's a common theme in Australia for asthmatics. Um, they, they get sent swimming by doctors. I wonder why. Uh, well, well, you know, we know yeah. the regulation of the breath. Yeah. And the swimming was brilliant for my asthma. But whenever I stopped, I would get sick or my asthma would come back. Now, I struggled at school. Um university wasn't an option for me i couldn't spell university um i was dyslexic i was you know i i read one of my reports today when i was looking for or the other day when i was looking for some of my certificates and it wasn't dean was disruptive dean was you know uh in maths was the one subject that i was good at and even though i got first in the class it said dean could do much better if he if he concentrated and put his mind to it um so you know these learning difficulties um, when I look back, I was a dysfunctional breather and actually the swimming um, sort of fed into that dysfunction, I believe. And it's really only the last five, eight years that I've completely got on top of it. And one of the things I tell people is that I feel smarter from taping my mouth shut at night and, and my nasal breathing. And they laugh, but I, I, I do follow mm. it up. In terms of swimming, you, you feel that swimming actually contributed to dysfunctional breathing? Well, swimming was my main sport, Patrick. I was swimming eight, ten times a week. Um, yeah. And, and you and reached a pretty good was, level as well, obviously. Yeah, I reached a great level at, at 18. I was had a national ranking of two in the 400 metres. And um, where was I? A seven, four, right. At this time, though, there were some fantastic swimmers that were you know, Ian Thorpe was at Olympic level and he was a couple of years younger than me. It was, you know, I was good, but I wasn't, you know, great. Um, I competed for the local surf club. You know, I made representative teams. We won races. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's still I, a I great accomplishment. Super. Hmm. Um, but coming back to it, because when I think about swimming and doctors do recommend, at least in my day, they, they did as well. I'm not sure if they do today. That if a child was was susceptible to asthma, they told the child to go and swim. Now I'm not sure if the doctor actually understands why. Our take, as you know, Dean, is that when you're swimming, the water is pressing up against you, mm. so that you're breathing against resistance, and this is going to reduce the volume of air that you breathe relative to what you need, and it's also pressing up against you, so that it's going to add an extra load onto the breathing muscles. Yeah, we have to improve strength of the breathing muscles. And then, of course, the child does some dives and they go down into the water and they're doing breath toting and carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood and that's happened to open up the airways. And yes, people often say, well, when you're swimming, you're mouth breathing. Yes, but you're only mouth breathing maybe once every three or five or seven strokes. So there's a number of reasons why swimming is beneficial. But as you alluded to, when you stop swimming, your asthma come back. And that's why, you know, probably due to there's no guidance for the kids who are swimming, but when they come out of the pool, what do they do? Mm. Um, fatigue is very common with asthma. And, you know, Australia is one of the highest instances of asthma I'm in the world. Aware, yeah. I worked with an asthma with a young child yesterday with asthma and her mum was brilliant. She was onto it. But we, you know, we went through, you know, a couple of the pillars of functional breathing and, you know, just sort of broke everything down for her. And, um, yeah, you know, she took a lot away from that session. And funny enough, because my background was Buteco, is well, it still is Buteco, and Australia was the first country in the world that Buteco 
landed in outside of the Soviet Union. And it was a, it was somebody that was flying from the USSR to Australia, but had an asthma attack on board. And there was somebody on the plane at the time that brought them out of the attack by using the small retos, breathing recovery exercise. So it's quite interesting. I know there's always, you know, it's difficult for non-pharmaceutical approaches, though, to kind of make headway. But mm. a little bit of the history there with Australia. So you're working with a young child. What age was the child? She was little. How old was she? She was three or four. Oh, she was tiny. She was um, tiny. Yeah. And I, I couldn't get too close to her at all. So it was more an educational session for, for mom. mom. I ended yeah. up doing all the yeah. exercises with mom and got and got mum to understand fully what's going on. And um, yeah, mum was going to have to go home and, and do some assessments and, and try and explain it to her again. But that's part of yeah. the, that's part of the um, you know, action plan, educating the parents. Yeah, because these kids, they have a stuffy nose. As you said, you know, they can struggle with sleep. They are tired. If you're tired, you're not going to do so well in school. Mm. And you can have a very bright child. And they're, they're falling back because of fatigue. None of us can concentrate if, if we've had a bad yeah. night's sleep. So taping yeah, of the mouth. Sorry. She'd just done some work expanding the pal roof of her palate, you know, and we were hypothesizing whether that made her airway smaller or what was going on in, in that, um, in that, you know. With it's that a little expander. bit like the chicken and the egg. Yeah. So, you know, the child could be born with quite a high palate. Mm -hmm. And even in the womb, when I was talking with Professor John Mew there last, no, it was just before Christmas, having the tongue resting up in the roof of the mouth in utero helps to develop the, the top jaw. But sometimes the child doesn't necessarily have the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, or at least that's what I took from it. So but a child can breastfed, does the does that that would obviously makes a help, big difference. Right? Big yeah. difference. But so yeah, so she she, you know, her mum was on board, which was yeah, she was seeking out uh, a drug free yeah. option. Plus the um, very fact that the child is undergoing maxillary expansion at three years of age, the mum knows about early intervention. Mm. And it's not a particularly easy approach. The traditional approach is an easier approach. But at the same time, her approach is helping to develop the, the jaws and the face. So, so coming back to you, um, so you were, you were a child with asthma, you were swimming. And what, what happened then? Or what's... Yeah, I struggled at school, Patrick. There mm. was really no opportunity for me to, and no interest really in, in sort of going on for any formal education. Um, yeah, I, I sort of had lack direction. Um, and ended up starting a, a trade as a plumber with mm. some local guys from the surf club. Um, That's all right. Enjoyed that. And the dust from from working in rooms and that used to get used to get in my throat. And I used to get sick. I used to get sick quite a lot. And training um, a lot, you know, I used to get run down all the time. Um, what do they call it when you're um, run down? My mind's gone blank. And chronic fatigue. So used to sort of, you know, train all that training would end up with chronic fatigue. Now, looking back, my diet was horrible. I'm sure I was mouth breathing at night, um, you know, and it, it just wasn't, had no understanding of sort of no connection with my body, but still doing relatively well at my sport. Um, my social life was all right. My family was really supportive. Um, you know, life wasn't bad. Mm. Um, I wasn't breastfed as a child. Um, there's a couple of connections that I've sort of gone back through, but yeah, I, um, I sort of really struggled with, with the breathing and sickness and I started doing yoga in my mid twenties. And when I started doing yoga, I started to get, um, some of the regulation of my breath. And, and I believe it was the, um, the regulation of the breath. So breathing sort of every third stroke or every fifth stroke, um, that, that helped me the most. And yoga started giving me what swimming was giving me. And really, um, you know, when people talk about breath work, swimming for me was breath work. Yeah, and just... then yoga um, was, was breath work. And, um, yeah, I went on to become a yoga teacher or, or started teaching yoga and, and started sort of coaching people. Um, I had a bit of a, um, 
a life incident where I was king hit and had my four front teeth knocked out. So that um, that um, there's some horrible photos on the internet if you if you want to look them up or share them. But that that pretty much was the best and worst day of my life. That that destroyed my health. That gave me anxiety, post traumatic stress. I ended up with dermatitis and an mm. allergy. So I used to scratch myself if I bled at night. Um, yeah, all these food allergies and sensitivity, gluten sensitivity, sugar sensitivity. So I was, I was so stressed and broken, and and I sort of had the whiplash, which this is fake. You probably well, can't tell. No, I can't um, tell at all. Yeah, you can you can tell from underneath. So yeah, after that, Patrick, that was two thousand and five. Um, after and that's that, when that was going on a lot in Australia as well, the King Punch. The laws so, have changed significantly. Since, they did, but they had to, you know, because it just for the listeners, you could be just going about your normal daily routine or maybe after a nightclub and you're standing at the footpath and some guy comes over and gives you a full force whack in the face. Like, yes. it's crazy stuff. Um, And we, that, can, we were hearing about that over here, so we were. Yeah. So the judges then started putting really strict and, and harsh sentences and that quelled it down a bit. It shouldn't even be yeah. called a king punch. It should be called a coward's punch. Yeah, a coward's punch. That's what they, there's a, that's a con- campaign to call it, the cow, a coward's punch. So, mm. um, yeah, after that, I had this hypersensitivity to, to everything. And I ended up with a, a guy called Paul Cech. Um, or a Czech practitioner. Yes, yes, yeah. And we went back and we sort of re-looked at everything. And I was with this guy named Aaron McKenzie and he was talking about forgiving the guy that did it to me. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this guy talking about? Yeah. But then we went and looked at my nutrition. We looked at my breathing. We looked at my hydration and we looked at my body holistically and we just started to change everything. And when I went on to study my health coaching through Czech, um, I was walk- working full time as a lifeguard at this stage and didn't really know why I was doing it. But but regardless, did it. And that's when I first started to teach people to breathe di- diaphragmatically, sort of 2010, 2011. Um, so it's really interesting. And I'm just going to come back to the guy, right? Because I think many of the listeners here who have faced trauma, Dean, mm. unfortunately, life is life. And we've all probably faced it. We've all had, you know, yeah, absolutely. some issue. But he said for you to give, forgive the guy. And I can understand it, it is a very, very difficult thing, but I suppose his motive is our alternative is that it eats us inside, that we mm. keep on thinking about it and that we have a hatred towards the person. And it's a very natural human thing as well. I, you know, I would do it too. I'm sure everybody else that's listening have been in that situation. So if somebody is after doing some grievous harm and they've done it once, but we continue to rehearse it over and yeah. over and over. And now the point is it's actually doing us harm. So there is something about that, even though it's not easier, it's a much easier alternative than just kind of dwelling on it. Um, it was an interesting... Well, speaking to the psychologists mm. and reliving it over and over again actually made it worse for me. Um, you know, because I'd bounce around from different people, doctors trying to put me on sleeping medication. I had high cholesterol. They wanted me on cholesterol-lowering drugs. Um, which which are very controversial yeah, statins the, the statin drugs are, are, are not nice there's some i read a book written by a doctor who had a horrible mm. horrible incident with the statin drugs but so so from my experience then mainstream medicine and i, I don't want to nothing against mainstream medicine but it wasn't able to really give me what i needed yeah um this check coach aaron mckenzie was brilliant and yeah, by changing my diet, I re- rebuilt the body from the ground up. You know, we looked at thoughts, breathing, and breathing. The way the check um, sort of totem pole was, the thoughts were at the top, and breathing was next. So before nutrition, before movement, your breathing is right up the top of what they look at when they're assessing someone. That's really interesting. Which, which was mind blowing, and 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 how he came to that, he was coaching these athletes. And he could give them the best program in the world, but if they're if they're not thinking right, then and they're not they're not breathing right. There's no point not eating right. The the best program in the world is not going to work for them. Yeah, and we know it now. Like yeah. I'm, I used to sort of look and try and teach people those six things. Now I'm particularly focused just on the breathing. 
Yeah. And I know how powerful that is in some cases for people doing 10 minutes a day mm -hmm. and, and some now taping at night, which is just an absolute game changer. Again, yeah. not for everyone, for some people. Um, you know, some people so, are naturally breathing nasally at night, but there's a lot of us who, who are. 50%, I would say, over the years. Um, and waking up with a dry mouth is a good indicator if you have the mouth open during sleep. So you're talking about breathing here. For somebody who, who isn't into breathing, and I'm assuming they are because they're listening to this podcast because it will be on our channel, but who knows? Um, what do you think is the biggest? Like, I have my ideas in this. What do you think breathing has gave you? What's the best advantage it has gave you as a tool in your everyday life? Is it your physical performance? Is it your mental performance? What What is it? Or what do you think? Yeah, it's a combination, Patrick. You know, at, I'm 44 now, and I feel like I'm getting, you know, stronger and smarter. And, um, you know, I'm continuing to grow and evolve. Yeah. Um, when I was young, I was super fit. I used to get sick all the time. I used to, on the edge of chronic fatigue, um, we used to compete at the Aussie titles every year. And I used to go and get like an antibiotic script from the doctor just before the titles because you used to just train yourself to fatigue and exhaustion. Um, so, yeah, that connection, that mind-body connection that I have now and that, that understanding, and I'm able to sort of push my limits and work seven days a week and, you know, and even sometimes go with, go without sleep but, and still not get sick and still function yeah. um, pretty, pretty well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a father of two or my girlfriend's got two kids as well. So we've got four kids and, and two dogs sometimes. And life that's, a, that's a big household. Mm. So, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's everything, but I feel like I'm just performing so much better and, you know, I never thought I was capable of getting up and speak public speaking or teaching people anything. And that's what, when I got attacked, my body stopped working. And part of my stress or fear was without my body, I was unable to be a plumber or a lifeguard. And that was my ability to earn an income. And so that was taken away from me. And that added to my stress even more. Yeah, no, totally. Um the chronic fatigue is interesting because we've came across it before in top athletes that they're pushing and pushing and pushing and the whole mode of our idea in the Western world, well, it may be changed now, is keep doing it, keep pushing, mm. keep breaking yeah. it down and you achieve what you need to achieve. And was there ever any mention of recovery? Because has the, has the if you were working with an athlete today, is that athlete still predisposed to chronic fatigue today or was that just something that happened 15, 20 years ago. My point here is, is there a greater emphasis now on recovery in professional athletes or even recreational athletes in terms of, yes, you push yourself hard, but make sure you recover. How do you recover? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, recovery is huge. Some of the old school swimming coaches, like they're, they're brutal. Like they just, they, they just break, push people till they break and they have success. Um, and I think there'd be an inverted, you know, like a hormetic stress, an inverted U um, graph where some people are able to tolerate all that, all that work and they perform, whereas others don't need it. And it's the individualizing of, of coaching is, is what people need. So the athletes I've worked with have sought me out and it's always different when an athlete seeks you out as opposed to, you know, I, I'm working with a couple of professional clubs is when you go into a club and work with, work with the whole club. So, and, and that's the same even in workplaces. You know, mm -hmm. people seek you out for a one-on-one -on -one session and then, oh, come, I want you to come to my work and, and teach everyone and you get in there and people or, or teaching on Zoom, um, you know, they, they don't even have their screens on, you, you know, they're, so they're, they're not quite, they don't have the buy-in. Yeah, yeah, no, I would agree. Somebody that seeks you out, they know a little bit about it and they know there's something in it. But when we think about recovery, it's not necessarily that we're doing recovery to bring us back to where we are, but you pointed to it. You are now, you've improved concentration. You're more resilient. You're better able to handle stress. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but you've kind of alluded to it anyway. Yeah. Recovery is really about building yourself up. So just as you train hard to build yourself up, by practicing techniques to improve 
to, to recover. So down regulation, light breathing, slow breathing, nose breathing, low breathing, um, relaxation, saunas, things like that. That's all part of the recovery. And that then brings you to a higher place that you're more resilient and you're better able to cope then with the hard work. So it should be part of somebody's training. But Dean, yeah. like sometimes in my head, I feel that, well, I think it's changed a bit. Like when I wrote the Oxygen Advantage book, I never put the word breathing into the title. And there was a reason being is because that was only in 2016, 2015, um, that people thought about breathing and they're thinking about this woo woo and all of these nonsense, you know, the kind of all the paraphernalia that goes yep, with it. There's nothing woo woo about that. Is that changing in Australia, do you think? Is it still woo woo? Slowly. Slowly. Um, I was working with a, a rugby professional rugby league club this year. Um, and actually this week, and I was there and it was the first session and, we, and I've got four weeks with them. And we we're talking about breathing and it, and it was, I'm working with a mental skills coach and he's, the, the breath work complements the mental skills stuff beautifully. It's, they're, they're so connected. But, you know, he introduced me and, and next week we'll go through, we'll do bolt scores and MBTs and CO2 tolerance assessments and, and we'll do all the stuff. But I wanted to get up and because he didn't say breathing for performance. And that's what I wanted these guys to know, that breathing will help their performance. Because awesome. I, I felt, you know, there may be a little couple of thoughts that it's just going to be a meditation for them. And, um, and yeah. But, the you know, the recovery stuff is more and more talked about. Um, you know, HRV, the, these words, when I was first doing... Um, my stuff with the Czech Institute, the words parasympathetic and, and sympathetic nervous system, they were a little bit jargony. These words are a common knowledge now in Australia. In Australia, like if you say that to a high school kid, they they know what this stuff means. So there's definitely a huge shift. But on the professional level, I still see an element of, of push, push, push. Mm -hmm. I can't see why they can't. Why did they shouldn't do it? And I'll just tell you this, right? Can you imagine a player out in the field and they have to hold their attention to be fully in, involved with their attention on the game? We're talking 50, 60, 70 minutes. And if the mind wanders, they've lost focus. And when, when physical fatigue sets in, mental fatigue is setting in. Has anybody taught any of these guys how to concentrate to hold their attention? And Brett comes in there because if your physiology is in a state of balance, mm -hmm. If you have good night's sleep, and a lot of rugby players are prone to sleep apnea, and also I'm not so much, I suppose, um, as your rules, but some of the bigger guys would be because they, if they have a, a wider neck circumference, mm. they're more prone to sleep disorder breathing. They're waking up feeling tired. They're not going, their head isn't going to be in the game. But yeah. I remember like working with sometimes with, with athletes and I'm feeling if I'm getting some pushback, I'll push them. And I'll start off easy enough and I'll talk about, you know, mental and physical fitness. And then I'll get them doing some long breath holds. And literally the joke is I'll turn them blue and then they know there's something in it at the end of it. You know, we need to get people to experience it because, again, we have to get away from that whole. This isn't about meditation. This is about, you know, you can do breath holding to cause adaptations. You know this. Um adaptations in the body that are stronger than doing a sprint at the highest intensity that you can do but there's no there's no trauma involved with it there's no risk of of you know of injury um now we're not saying to go blue but we're saying to challenge yourself but to recover within a couple of breaths so it's kind of it's the forgotten g g gem in terms yeah. of training yeah i had an interesting issue with the some of these rugby league players their noses are banged up so I didn't actually want to increase their stress by telling them they had to breathe nasally at night. Um, I was trying to position it a way, in a way where it would be optimal if they could. Yeah. Um, you, you, but, you know, you, sorry, I was going to say, it's an interesting thing there. And yeah. people are aware of focus and um, attention, but they're not aware of the science behind it. That's in my opinion. And I think I can relate that to, to being a lifeguard. You know, when, when people are in a rip, the advice is don't panic. That's the advice to someone who's potentially drowning. And in Australia, 400 people drown every year. Um, oh. So it's quite significant. So 
you know you can't teach someone how to deal with stress when they're potentially in a life or death situation. So for me, part of my interest in in what I'm doing and what I'm sharing is is teaching people the science behind don't panic. And we know that's very much connected to breathing. Yeah, it's it's a seeing it because if you panic if you panic you're going to make mistakes if you panic what happens you you use your reserves you do the wrong thing you're splashing about in the water and you, you're going to get tired is that the whole yeah that's it and it's actually it's counterintuitive patrick because mm. you're in a rip you start to panic um you go into fight or flight your heart rate increases those you know our pupils dilate and we we see the shore there and we think, yes, I've got all this energy, I should go to shore, when in actual fact, they need to relax, conserve energy, stay calm, and, and, and stay afloat. And there's a new, a new campaign out, and it's called Float to Survive. If people can just float, they will potentially float onto a sandbank, or someone will come and save them. Wow. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. So... Some stress cool. responses, when you think about it, are counterintuitive, right? We go into stress, you know, it, we, our brain goes, the blood goes away from our analytical brain, and we just yeah, do all we want to do is get exactly out of the situation. The yeah, but we we do the wrong thing in any situation. That's like right. if I'm here with my crew, and if I was to go into a panic mode, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to do the wrong thing. You know, that kind of way. Um, and when you think about the even the measure of a leader is the individual who's able to maintain calm and focus when things are going wrong. Like, look at any football game, you know, and you've got you've got the losing side. But if you have one or two really capable individuals on the losing side who are able to stay calm, stay focused, stay motivated, and rally the troops, and, you know, that can, that can be the difference between winning and losing. I'm going to come back to the rugby guys. Because a lot of them have had knocks and elbows, and even in soccer and different games, and I'm sure Aussie rules, there's a few, there's a few um, noses that are that are not working so well. It's very common. It's about sixty percent of the the Western population have a deviated septum, and what I mean by that is that the line that divides the left side of the nose to the right is crooked, so it impairs airflow then through either one side of the nose or the other. Now. It's a really common question, and I'll say it because sometimes people will be thinking about, well, I have that nose. Can I actually breathe through it? I'd say to them, once you're not pregnant, of course, or if you don't have panic attacks or anxiety, take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose, hold your nose, and do the nose and blocking. Walk around holding your breath. And continue walking and holding your breath until you build up a moderate air hunger, moderate to strong air hunger. Then let go. Get your breathing under control. Wait a minute. Do it again. Do it a few times. And see, does your nose open up? Because if your nose opens up, then you know that your obstruction is due to reversible. But if it doesn't open up, then you know it's more mechanical. Now, for the mechanical, then we can use the cottle maneuver. So you put one hand either side of the nose and you just gently prise. Does that make life a little bit easier? Yeah. And to use a breathe right strip or something during sleep. So but I would when say. I teach the nose on blocking exercise, Patrick, I, I, mm. I modified it to include breath holds um and this sort of like a face massage and i find it really effective to get people massaging in the face pulling the nose one way pulling the nose the other way whilst they're holding the breath and i love using a little bit of diluted peppermint oil um, with some mct it really just it's a game changer for people um Great. so this is so helping them with drainage hmm even even up here we've got some uh, sinuses nasal cavities so yeah it can um, yeah all mm. these just and you can just hear that their breath mm. change because if the nose is stuffy it's not just a stuffy nose the sleep is yeah. the biggest thing and if sleep is affected concentration and focus is affected but also if the, the nose is stuffy the person is going to breathe through the mouth mouth breathing is going to cause upper chest breathing you've got reduced recruitment of the diaphragm this impacts functional movement. So dysfunctional movement, then the player is more prone to injury. So there's a lot going on with the simple nose that I we know. don't think about. You know, even visual spatial awareness, our ability throughout our evolution, our ability to have our focus on, uh, if we're hunters, hunters at the time, we had our focus on, on the, the deer or the animal, the prey, but we were also re 
scanning the environment for any threats. So if there was an animal that was going to eat us. So we were we had our focus on the animal that we wanted to eat. And at the same time, we had to be scanning yeah. for any animals that wanted to eat us. And that visual spatial awareness is improving nose breathing. So you can translate that into today's. You're out in a football field. You, you have your eye on the ball. But at the same time, you're watching, you're scanning everything. And you're doing it. And so the mouth breeder is not going to have as good a visual spatial awareness than the nose breeder. So, yeah, there's so many different things. You know, the more we think about the nose, it's actually quite fascinating, isn't it? Um, so here's a question. During swimming, should you have the mouth open or should you be breathing through your nose? What's your take on it? I haven't fully tried. Well, I've, I've tried to nose breathe swimming a couple of times and it was very unsuccessful um so yeah i, I don't think it's possible whilst you're swimming and is now, it because the you, water yeah it just yeah the water you're sniffing um, the water into your lungs yeah, it, which is and, not going to work and when you're swimming you need to, to shortly and sharply breathe in and, and 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 hold and then you you actually exhale through the nose when you're swimming so the nose is involved um, but then for swimmers, it's really important to get them a sort of nasal breathing, you know, the other 23 and a half, 23 hours of the day, particularly at night and, and just get in, you know, potentially five to 10 minutes of, of nasal breathing just to retrain that or, or, you know, encourage that behavior, reinforce it. The boat score and the maximum breathlessness test must be a helpful score for swimmers because you were talking about say, for example, taking a breath every three strokes. Do some swimmers take a breath every five strokes? Do some of them increase it one one breath every seven strokes? Does that happen? Yeah, so in when when I swam, we used to do hypoxic training and you do drills. You do three, five, seven. Um, you were trained not to take a breath in between the flags and the wall. And, you know, when you're really tired, you lift your head before you turn to get that breath in which uh, the coaches used to get cranky at so yeah we were training co2 tolerance in the swimming but yeah not understanding um the exact science behind it which is amazing to me it's mind-blowing that uh, it's amazing. i spoke to an, a great american coach the other day and he just he didn't know he he basically knew the basics of hypoxic training and i think it's more hypercapnic training than yes. hypoxic to, to be honest um, and he just didn't really know the fundamentals of it. And that's, you know, how these high paid coaches don't know more about it is, is mind blowing. So I'm hoping to do some work with him as my background was, was swimming. And I think you know, with some easy intervention um, that I've already mentioned would be able to get some great changes and stop people from trouble down the track. Years and we'd be able to prevent things years, years ahead. We would be able to prevent. Yeah, prevent sickness, prevent injury, prevent, you know, improve sleep, like the compound interest on nasal yeah. breathing over time from all the things we've mentioned. Um, you know, getting sick less is a game changer. Sleeping better. And everything's connected to everything else yeah. we're, we're talking about. And, you know, we, whilst we can't put exact values and figures on it, but it's certainly, it's certainly more than a 1%. And if a person's a dysfunctional breather, when they come to my workshops, we sort of do a big group assessment. And sometimes people have some really low bolt scores and, mm. and struggle with the MBT. And I said, listen, you are going to get the most out of this course. This is going to be really um, life-changing mm. for you, this course. Uh, and, you know, the people over there that did really well, they're not going to get as much out of it. Yeah. So I like to frame it like that. A swimmer with a low bolt score, what would that translate into? Well, they're they're an overbreather. They're um, you know, they're they're super fit whilst they're whilst they're mouth breathing, and and you know, you would have seen successful athletes that, that mm. are mouth breathers, right? Um, you know, I, I did really well. Um, you know, although I got sick a lot, um, my posture was poor. Um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't doing well at school, but I was sort of performing pretty well as a swim, swimmer as an athlete. Um. You know, I, I had shoulder problems and that over time. So I think, you know, the longevity and the posture, there's so many things connected to breathing. But, Would there be um, another aspect that if you're swimming with a low bolt score, that you're going to have more difficult taking the breath every three, five or seven strokes because you feel a stronger air hunger? 
Absolutely. And the the reason that you want to take less strokes going across the pool is is it because of loss of propulsion in the water? So in the in the fifty meter sprint, they you know take one or or zero breaths across the fifty um, meters. Across the fifty, yeah. Um, and you know I think they do that in twenty twenty one seconds. It was sort of twenty two, you know, maybe twenty years ago. So that they are getting faster. But yeah, generally sort of people breathe every two or every three strokes. Um, you know, I'm not involved as much. Um, I do hear stories, you know, on, on delving into the research and seeing stuff about people trying to improve their stroke efficiency. I still think there's there's value. Um, the more value is is getting the better sleep, getting the better recovery, um, nasal breathing in between sets, nasal breathing before the race to calm down. Um, or for yeah, some people, maybe totally. lifting their energy up. I don't yeah. see. I don't see when people are racing. Um, so you're talking about left. preparation pre-competition. So using training, breathing to change your states. Sleep, health. Yeah. You know, yeah. getting six less from nasal breathing yeah. is going to improve your performance. Um, in the gym, it should be all nasal. Our, our foam rolling. But, you know, for, for a swimmer, if I was coaching, you know, every two or three strokes in a race would probably be, depend, unless they're doing sort of that 50 or 100 metres. Um, yeah, you know, I like to work with individuals differently and, and I like to assess and reassess. And the bolt score and the MBT are, are brilliant for that. But, you know, specifically um, for a swimmer, we'd be looking at their time. And the mm. swimmer that I worked with, uh, they had a set where they used to do five four hundreds on repeat on repeat on a certain number of time and and that was a good gauge of how he was going and this guy was we got some mouth mouth taping we got some nasal breathing um didn't modify how he was breathing when he swam but we we modified how he was breathing the rest of the day and i actually got him training less because i felt that he was overtrained and he he was fearful of that and i said listen let's just assess it with your with your four hundreds and um yeah he was able to i guess have the confidence people need to be empowered patrick they do and, um, they do yeah one of our instructors i don't know if you know him leo daniel ryan he's based here in ireland he's a strength and conditioning coach he ran a marathon without training for the marathon he just did breathing exercises and which is amazing really um so you're talking about you're introducing to a swimmer you're saying to cut back a little bit of training but we're going to give you a breathing exercise instead which will help to maintain and even improve your form because we're targeting. Like I suppose, Dean, it makes sense because respiration is the thing that often holds you back. That sensation of breathlessness. Mm. And if you have an athlete with a low boat score, their breathing is very inefficient. You know, so really what we're doing is by training breathing is we're training them to do more with less. Yep. So with every breath that they take, that they can get more out of it. And what you're saying is you don't necessarily you're not too concerned with how they're breathing in the pool because you don't want to interrupt their game, which is fair enough, but you're looking at their breathing for the other 23 hours a day. And I think that's the nugget. That's what's been overlooked. You know, no, we how could definitely what in that we're in training, Patrick, we could definitely hmm. load up their hypercapnic stuff. Okay. Those hypoxic drills do the three, five, seven. But yeah. when we come to racing, Oh, sorry, think, racing. Yes. I think when we're racing, we want, yeah. we want, I agree with you. In that. You yeah. want to get as much air in as possible. Yeah. During a race, I will always say, or even during a competition, I was working with a boxer before Christmas there, and he's going for a world title in March. And, you know, it's working with an athlete of this caliber. It's, it's, it's tremendous because they'll take everything on board and they put it in and they're so driven. And it's almost, you know, you're training them to, to go through a brick wall, but it's about conservation of mental energy and physical energy. Um, to be able to last 12 three minute rounds and my point is gone in what i was going to say but yeah if you if people don't understand if, if anyone's done three minutes of boxing they will know yeah. how tough it is and then to think of like you said someone punching you like the respect of fitness boxers have oh it's an amazing fitness but it's also a, it's a mental thing as well you know it's that fear of getting into the ring that your opponent yeah. is there like you're going you're going to you're going out to have a fight okay the gloves are on but the gloves you still you still feel it with the gloves on 
you know, it's, it's not a walk in the park. So yeah, I have a lot of I have a lot of respect for anybody who's who's in, involved with, with any sport like that. Um so just coming back to the 23 hours then. The work then is also involved with improving their boat score. For those of you who don't know what a boat score is, it's the length of your comfortable breath hold time after an exhalation. And it gives you some degree of your feedback of breathlessness. So you do the breathe light exercise and this is down regulation. So if you have an anxious person then going into a race, like it's, it's always that thing, isn't it? Balance mm-hmm. of the autonomic nervous system. Absolutely. If you're too anxious, it's going to mess you up. And if you're too too relaxed, it's going to mess you up. So to get that balance, you you you're working with the breathe light, breathe slow. Yeah. And then t- you said that with some athletes, you need to upregulate. So you have them do breath holds. You might even yeah. have them do some hyperventilation if it's controlled. Yeah. Well, everything breathing when, when I'm working with an athlete, like they just understand so much more about what their body is going through. They understand, and once they understand, they can influence it. And that's what that's why I'm empowering people. This is just teaching them about their own body, teaching them that mind body connection. And you know, you could almost argue mind and body are the one thing, you know, where <laughs> where where is the difference? But um, yeah, the, well, the mind and body should be the one thing because but most of us, especially in the Western world, we have our attention so stuck in our heads and we're so disconnected to the body, you know, and I think it's a really good habit is whenever we go about our daily activity, if you go for a walk is walk with every cell of the body. If you're going for a swim, swim with every cell of the body that you, you disperse your attention throughout the body. And again, there's nothing about it to any of you who are getting turned off. You're thinking it's a bit new agey. Not but at all. To apply this to lifeguarding, Patrick, you know, yeah. my goal is to um, teach people not to panic in rip. Yeah, yeah. And this can save lives. Teaching somebody not to panic in a rip is the same as teaching them not to panic in any life situation. Absolutely. But we're not taught how to deal with stress. You know, we, we spend 16, maybe 12 to 16 years of formal education. We come out of it, we're not able to concentrate and we're not able to handle stress. Like it's for me, it's I don't know, it's a no brainer. Um, so yeah, it's it's where do you think breathing is going in Australia? Do you you see a trajectory happening? Do you see what do you see happening? Yeah, it's it's popular, it's very popular. Um, what what has driven it? Well, the Wim Hof, yeah, Wim's been huge for, for breathing, but that brings people into breath awareness. Yeah. Um, and once they get breath awareness, I think that brings them into the oxygen advantage. It bring it, it, the foot is in the door. Um, yeah, and, and, I know. I think some of the OA and the Buteco people, you know, they're maybe not so into you know controlled hyperventilation. Whereas, <laughs> so where I, I believe the breath awareness is key. You like, I, I want people to have breath awareness, and um, you know, I, I I trained with Wim. Um, years ago, I'm, I'm not a Wim Hof instructor anymore, but yeah, I, I do love the technique for because it gets people loving breathing. And once they love breathing, um, then they really understand breathing light and how powerful it is. Yeah, no, I get it. I think Wim Hof has done amazing things in terms of the awareness out there. Um, the ice bath as well. We were just talking yeah. about stress, right? When you put people in an ice bath, and I spoke to you about sort of using oxygen advantage techniques um, before and during an ice bath. And it is a great way to teach people to breathe light. You put them in a stressful situation and then they, they take their shoulders come up, they go to that mouth breathing, they go to that fast breathing, they go to that shallow breathing, and we want to just get them to relax, breathe slowly, lightly and deeply. And it's a really powerful tool. Do you think part of that is also a psychological? It's not just hormesis that it's causing a physiological adaptation, but you're putting something into an ice bath and the tendency is there to panic because it's really cold. But they're feeling very uncomfortable. They're feeling stressed and you're having them relax or surrender into the stress. So if you can relax when you're getting into an ice bath and if you can stay calm in the cold well, then you can transfer that ability to stay calm when difficult situations arise. Do you think there might be Absolutely. something going on there? Absolutely. Training people, you know, training people um, to deal with stress is 
um, you know, part of what I say that I do. I empower people to deal with stress and influence stress, and, and that improves performance. Both Are physical some... and cognitive. Do you ever see different personalities? There are some people more, if you have, say, a type A personality or an extrovert versus an introvert, do you ever notice any difference in personalities getting into the ice baths? Yeah, I, I, some people are trying to do everything. You've got those type A personalities that they're doing triathlons and they're meditating and they're doing yoga and they're doing their weights. They're trying and they're, they've got a whoop band and an aura ring. Um, yeah, they're trying to do too much and how do those guys fare how does in terms of do you do you ever see a particular personality trait in the ice or is it just that everybody kind of approaches it with the same demeanor yeah what do i what do i see um people are quite fearful of the ice um although it's becoming you know where i live in bondi in, in australia it's it's like the epicenter of of, of health in, in Australia you know there's there's organic shops there's you know people are up training at five or six in the morning there's yoga studios and personal trainers and we are really amongst health and wellness there's models and celebrities and um, you know a, a lot of focus there's hundreds of gyms within a, a five kilometer radius of me um, so it's very much yeah. part of the culture. So people very are going much. to give it a go. It's spreading it's out. A yeah. I don't think you have to say to anybody that Bondi is in Australia. I think Bondi is probably one of the more uh, well-known destinations in the world and the planet. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's really interesting. So I'm thinking about bringing it to a close because we've been talking for almost almost one hour. And wow. yeah, time flies, Dean. So you're giving a, you're giving instructor training an oxygen advantage in in Sydney and also in other parts of yep. Australia. Yeah, it's got Melbourne coming up in uh, when's that tenth and twelfth March. Twenty twenty three. Yeah, twenty twenty three. Yeah, it's it's not too far away, and yeah, you're coming out in November, which is mm, always. I'm exciting. looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I hope to get you at the beach this time. You're you're a very busy man. And yeah, we might even get you uh, in a stressful situation, uh, <laughs> get, get you in the ripper and the current and, um, you know, play with those hormetic stresses firsthand. I'm looking forward to it because if you see now the weather that we have out here, this is my front garden and uh, uh, gray skies and wide open. <laughs> So, yeah, so heading to Australia in November is going to be pretty cool to get some of that vitamin D and a bit of light exposure. So, you can see my sunburnt, sunburnt nose. <laughs> so, Dean, it's been a pleasure. And fi final thoughts? Um, always a pleasure. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Um, you know, I, I'm loving what I'm doing. Um, you know, I'm talking about breathing a lot, uh, more and more. You know, more and more work. You know, I love to work with, um, you know, professionals. And then I, I love to help people with their mental health. So it's so broad and so different. Mm. And, yes, of course, and even... I had that, that, that young girl with asthma. Yeah. She was in here on Tuesday. What day is Wednesday for me? But yeah. Yeah, who knows for the people listening to the podcast. So, yeah, it's been mm. a sort of fascinating week. Um, still involved in, you know, working at Bondi Rescue as a lifeguard. And, again, that's that's dealing with stressful situations for me. And, and other people and um you know there's no more stressful situation than trying to bring someone back to life and if you could how that, often Patrick, might it happen how, how often might you encounter a situation like that would it be once a month or no less probably for me in a in a 22 23 year career there's probably been about 20 resuscitations that i've been involved in maybe 25 and um that is a just it's still a lot. full on sensation. Um, now, some of those have been suicides, um, which has been tragic. Um, but yeah, you know, in Australia, 4,000 people kill themselves every year. You know, I talked about 400 people drowning. We've got wow. sort of 10 times that um, committing suicide, which is, which is horrible. But again, another area where breath work is so important. Absolutely. And, and where I've seen huge success in helping people with their mental health. And connecting mind to body, which are, as we know, absolutely. Time. And these are the tools that we should be learning in school, you know, mm. because we all get into situations that situations can unfold, 
and we get consumed by thought and we're drowning in thought. And mm. if we continuously drown in thought over a period of weeks and months and years, and, you know, it is a recipe for where do we take it? Mm. And giving people that capacity to be able to stop thinking. And we can learn to stop thinking. I know it's not always easy because the mind runs yeah. off. But what's the alternative? The alternative is living in our heads. And yeah. we, we've all been living in our heads, Dean. You know, mm. I come oh, out of school living in my head, totally immersed in thought, totally racing for the future. You know, it's the education of the future is about, it's not about studying geography. It's, it's not about studying history. We can read that at any time. It's about giving us real life skills, mm. skills that we can use for the rest of our life. And, and breathing should be in that. Well, I um, get so excited when I see young kids coming to my course, yeah. like kids in high school, yeah. learning, learning this stuff and, and yeah. interested in yeah. health and wellness. And, you know, what I what I did as a lifeguard, I, I was saving people and I've rescued thousands of people. And I see a continuation of that in, in what I'm doing now, helping people and in some yeah. case saving them. That might yeah. not be as, um, Absolutely. as pointy, but yeah, saving lives. And improving quality of life. And very often the people who will revert towards breathing are people who have had issues. I came across breathing because of my own issues. It seems that you came across yoga initially and breathing because of your life experience. We've all had life experiences. Um, some are always though the good days are better than the bad days. Yeah. That's the way it is. And couples, you know, some couples don't sleep in the same bedroom, Patrick, yeah. because of snoring and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only is one of the partners suffering with choking at night the, the, you know the connection like i've heard stories of you know relationships blooming again from sleeping yeah. in the same room like it it's so beautiful to be able maybe to that's your maybe that's your your market you're going to be the new uh actually relationship thinking, manager dean i was thinking about a social media post and i know we were talking to this and my girlfriend and i we were, were kissing the other morning and like Ten years ago, or when I was, I would, I would never kiss a girl in the morning because I would have this horrible breath. Mm, mm, mm. I just need the right way to, to yeah, share yeah. that, and I seem to be sharing it with. <laughs> well, don't worry, it'll grab. Now, but... All you have to do is take your top off and put in a couple of sexy words in the title, and you'll have more views. That's where social media is. So, so yeah. <laughs> I put some photos up of my partner in her lingerie with with the sleep tape on and we sold a that lot will be that. absolutely that will get the most attention that's the world we're living in today anyway, sorry to say it's a, it's a, you know there's an eight minute video of me explaining how yeah that's not gonna work no 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 the old you have to... tape and then yeah. well people watch it i i, I reshare it and it's it's there because you know you need the resources to say the same the same thing over and over again good good dean it's been a pleasure thanks very much Patrick, thank you.